Good afternoon. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Robin Lipsky, and I'm the executive director of the Ninth Circuit's Historical Society. But in an earlier incarnation of my career, I was a deputy city attorney under the incomparable Louise Rennie. And so today, it is my special honor to be here to welcome you on behalf of both the Ninth Circuit's Historical Society and the Northern District's Historical Society. The mission of both of our societies is education about the vibrant legal history of the West, which we do in a variety of ways, including wonderful programs like today's. I'm here with the NDHS board president, Rigesh Tangri, who will tell you a little bit about today's program and our special guests. Thank you, Robin. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, th this program is, as you all know, in honor of Bill Edland, a longtime valued and esteemed member of our legal community, as well as a board member of both of the historical societies who are sponsoring this event, uh, and in honor of the first uh, recipient, the inaugural recipient of an award that we have created in, in Bill's honor, Louise Rennie, our former city attorney. Uh, I would like to just briefly welcome some special guests who we're very pleased to have with us here today, starting with Bill's widow, Iris Edland, who is here, uh, Louise Rennie's husband, Paul, uh, her daughter, Anne, her brother, John, and her, the close family friend, Monique Fries. We have from the Ninth Circuit, Judge William Fletcher, from the Northern District of California, Judge Yvonne Gonzalez Rogers, and from SF Superior Court, Judge Georgie and Judge Kahn. We have our city attorney, Dennis Herrera, we have board members from both of the historical societies, and we have from Senator, we have Senator Dianne Feinstein, state director, where did he go, there you are, <laughs> Jim Lazarus, you moved at the last second. Um, and I would now like to turn it over to Judge Alsup, who will take it from here. Thank you all for coming. It's my distinct privilege to be your MC today. Iris, I especially want to uh, welcome you personally. It's my distinct privilege to be your MC uh, because of the, uh, it's a great honor because of the two people that we will recognize today, Bill Edlin and Louise Rennie. I date back, I have just a few preliminary comments before we get to the real speakers today. I date back to an early era in San Francisco practice, the 1970s. In those days, the law firms only had one office. There was no multiple offices in Washington or LA. If it was a San Francisco law firm, it was a San Francisco only law firm. And that's where, in 1973, I began my practice in, in California. It was a small legal community. But as a young lawyer, I soon came to learn that one of, the, one of the giants in the practice in our district and in our Northern California area was Bill Edlin. Now he was a giant uh, in a wonderful way. And I came to know him very well over the years. I would summarize him in this way, as a professional, Bill played his hand as well as it could possibly be played. And he made the maximum number of tricks from the cards that were dealt him. And even though he didn't know what exactly you had in your hand, he could figure it out better than just about anyone. He was thoroughly honest, thoroughly prepared, thoroughly able. And he was generous to his opponents. And the reason he could afford to be so generous was because he was so able. When Bill passed away, we decided at the two historical societies that sponsor this event today uh, to begin an award in his memory and in his honor uh, for professionalism, the Bill Edlin Award for Professionalism in the Law. And today happens to be the very first occasion of many to come where we will present that award. 
My uh, privilege now to welcome to come and speak with you uh, is uh, Michael Abram and Jeff Fisher, who will tell us more about Bill Edlin. Please come forward. Thank you, Judge Alsop. Bill Edlin was born on August 31st, 1929. A couple pictures of young Bill. He graduated from Stanford and earned his law degree at Berkeley in 1953. His state bar number was 25,013. Shortly after graduation, Bill joined the law firm then known as Pillsbury, Madison, and Sutro in San Francisco, where he practiced for 43 years. Thereafter, he joined my law firm, Bartko, Zankel, Bunzel, and Miller, where he practiced for 17 years. He frequently mentioned that he liked to change law firms once every 40 years. <laughs> At Pillsbury, Bill rose to become one of the premier leaders of the firm's litigation groups, where he spearheaded significant antitrust securities and other high-stake litigation and appeals. While at Bartko Zenkel, Bill was one of the most active members of my firm. Like Theodore Roosevelt, Bill believed that life had no greater reward than hard work worth doing. I never saw anyone work harder than Bill. He was a skilled and gifted lawyer who left no stone unturned when pursuing his client's causes. When preparing briefs, he would engage in deep dives into legislative history, as well as contact authors of any treatises that he was going to cite or opposing counsel may have cited. In one matter, in support of a Daubert motion, he was able to obtain a declaration from the treatise of an opposing, excuse me, the declaration from a treatise author stating the opposing expert's report misconstrued the point made in the treatise. It was amazing. Like, nobody else would have thought to have called this professor at an East Coast University, develop a relationship over the phone, and obtain a declaration. But Bill would do that. He was an exemplary. He showed everyone the way to actually practice law correctly. Every writing needed to be edited at least four times, and most often seven times, before Bill considered it ready. Bill's excellence in writing was matched by his excellence at oral advocacy. His noteworthy contributions include Timberland Company versus Bank of America, establishing a standard for extraterritorial antitrust jurisdiction and the application of the Act of State Doctrine, Chevron Corp versus Pennzoil Company, representing Chevron in the leading case on intent in Schedule 13D disclosures, and Stilson versus Reader's Digest, representing the publisher in a leading case on rejection of class actions for invasion of privacy, a case that I cited again this week. While Bill had many interests outside of the law and regularly demonstrated his leadership in the community, he was particularly committed to the Law Center to Prevent Gun Violence, now known as the Guilford Center to Prevent Gun Violence. Bill was not only a founding member of the center, he served for many years on its board of directors and served a term as its president. Bill loved and was committed to the legal profession. He was a fellow of the American College of Trial Lawyers, a director of the Bar Association of San Francisco, and a trustee of the United States Supreme Court Historical Society. Bill was a long-serving director of both the Northern District and Ninth Judicial Circuit Historical Societies, as well as a friend and mentor to many of the judges serving on the Northern District. While Bill was a zealous advocate for his clients and relished the fight, he would approach every legal battle with integrity and preparation. He would also not countenance a lack of civility. Bill is survived by his wife, Iris Edlin, and his daughter, Campbell Edlin. My firm and I are very pleased that the Northern District and Ninth Circuit Historical Societies have founded an award in Bill's honor entitled the Bill Edlin Professionalism in the Law Award. Bill demonstrated on a daily basis how the practice of law should be meaningful and enriching, always striving for excellence. 
Bill was an exemplary legal professional who loved the law and the judiciary. We would all do well to emulate Bill Edlund. As a former president of the Ninth Circuit Historical Society, it's my distinct honor to represent the Historical Society this afternoon in connection with the award we've established in Bill Edlund's honor. I came to know Bill about a decade ago when he began serving on the board of the Ninth Circuit Historical Society. We were thrilled to have him. He was one of our most active members, and he served on our executive committee and became the secretary of the organization for several years before he passed away. I'm proud to call him my friend, and I miss hearing his voice, his wisdom, and his passion for the law and for legal history. I got to work closely with Bill on many projects over the years, including our Northern District Oral History Project, which resulted in us doing oral histories. I think we're over 10 Northern District, uh, District Court judges now, and that was largely because of Bill. Bill would have really enjoyed being here today, and he really would have enjoyed honoring Louise. Let me tell you a little bit about the award that we established in Bill's honor. As Judge also mentioned, when Bill passed away, we, along with the Northern District Historical Society um, that Bill also served on for many years, thought a great way to honor and remember him was to establish in, an award in his name that put a spotlight on something that he greatly valued and represented, it, professionalism. And he was the consummate professional, a terrific litigator, colleague and mentor who was also fair and cared deeply about the judiciary and the role that it played in society. The criteria that we selected for the award was we wanted to look for someone who had been based in Northern California where Bill practiced and who had demonstrated excellence as a lawyer both in written and oral advocacy as Bill did, civility, commitment to the legal profession, and leadership in the community. So those were the criteria that we applied and that we used in coming up with our inaugural recipient of the award, Louise. And it's hard to imagine someone more deserving of the award than Louise. I wanted to close by reading an email um, that we uh, received from Bill's daughter, Cammie, who couldn't be here today, uh, but she had some thoughts that she wanted to pass along as well. She wrote, my father would be so honored to have his name associated with professionalism, a word that meant so much to him. Professional conduct for my dad meant more than being an expert in the law. It was about civility, civility, honor, and ethics. It was about honesty and partnership, poise under pressure, grace, and attitude, and gratitude. It was about valuing every person who contributed to the case, the court, and the cause. I know he would be delighted with the selection of the first recipient, and I remember him speaking of Louise over the years. I know he would have raised a glass to the Ninth Circuit, which he loved dearly, to his colleagues at Bartco, to his fellow members of the, of the Historical Society, and to Louise. I would have done the same had I been able to make the trip. That's from Bill's daughter, Cammie. So, thank you very much. So let me give you a brief comment about the process that we went through. We, the, we formed a joint committee of the two historical societies and invited the public and the bar, of course, to give us nominations. And we had two rounds of nominations. And then our committee had a lot of work to do to go through and evaluate them. The committee was Judge Marilyn Patel, Michael Abram, Jeff Fisher, both of whom you've just heard from, Ragesh Tongre, the president of our local uh, Northern District Historical Society, John Briscoe, a former past president of our society, and Robin Lipsky, who you've already uh, met this, this afternoon. So we ourselves uh, gathered uh, several times to go through the 
nominees, and it was an embarrassment of riches, is the only way to describe it. Uh, and it was, it was uh, uh, one of those things that uh, on one, if, any given day we, would, we might say, well, how about this, how about that? But uh, at, the, at the end of the process, without any question, uh, Louise had unanimously risen to the top of this extraordinary group of nominees. Now, we look forward in the future to honoring more of the candidates that we evaluated, maybe next year or in years to come. Uh, but this year, we give the first annual award. Uh, but not just yet, not just yet. Give, 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 me, give, me, uh, give me a moment. Uh, I want to repeat what these criteria are. Excellence as a lawyer. Excellence as a lawyer. Civility. Commitment to the legal profession. Leadership in the community. Those are, that's a tall order. We're going to hear in just a moment from Dennis Aftergut, uh, uh, why Louise meets all of these criteria in spades. But I have just one or two brief comments that I would like to bring up from the uh, many, many uh, stories and accomplishments that we evaluated in our... Remember, those of you, many of you here in this distinguished group can date back to 19... 1978, and that uh, November horrible period when first there was Jonestown and then nine days later, uh, the mayor of San Francisco, uh, Moscone, was murdered and so was Harvey Milk. It was a disastrous time for the city. And in came uh, Diane Feinstein as our new mayor and appointed to the, the Board of Supervisors then was, uh, was our honoree today, Louise Rennie. Now, she served in that role for eight years and then ran for mayor, and her campaign slogan then was, not one of the boys. <laughs> not one of the boys. Well, she didn't win. However, she did then get appointed to be the city attorney. And Dennis is going to cover that. I'll just have one brief story there. And that is, in 1987, the U.S. Open was held in San Francisco at the Olympic Club, which then was all white, no African Americans, no women. No women. So this was an embarrassment for the city, and to the rescue came Louise Rennie. She discovered, even though it was a private club, she discovered that three of the holes at the golf course were on city-owned land. So she went to the Olympic Club and said, you better change your policy or start playing on a 15-hole course. <laughs> and that pretty quickly wrapped up that case. So at this time, uh, I have, before I bring Dennis up, I want to uh, read uh, from Senator Kamala Harris a certificate of recognition, which I will present to you in a moment, uh, uh, at la later this afternoon, Louise, but let me read it now. Certificate of recognition presented to Louise Rennie in honor of receiving the Bill Edlin Award for Professionalism in the Law from the Ninth Judicial Circuit Historical Society for your contributions to the legal community and commitment to public service, signed Kamala D. Harris, U.S. Senator, California. So this and more will, will come in just a moment. Dennis, would you please come forward and make the principal remarks? I think that um, Jim Lazarus would like to come up and make good, a presentation. Good. Oh, wait. I've goofed. Uh, okay. Let's do, let's do Jim Lazarus. He is... Get me out of the way, uh, and then you can uh, hear from uh, Dennis. I, I thought you were coming up yeah, later. It's all right. Whatever. Okay. Anyway, he is representing Whoops. Senator Feinstein today, and we'll, uh, 
read a letter from Senator Feinstein. Thank you, Your Honor. Whatever the boss over there says, we go in that order. Uh, it's a special time for me to be here uh, with some of my former colleagues. I guess there's a couple of us that are actually were appointed by Tom O'Connor to the city attorney's office and George Agnost and worked for both of those great city attorneys. And I spent a couple of months after the 1989 earthquake as a part-time deputy city attorney working with Louise. Um, and of course, the years of Dennis Herrera, we've, had, we've been represented for decades by great city attorneys and we're very fortunate. As was mentioned, Senator Feinstein, when she was mayor, selected uh, Louise for actually Diane's seat on the Board of Supervisors from that supervisorial district. And then in 1986, elevated Louise to city attorney. And not only did, do they have a great professional relationship, but a great personal friendship. Diane is back in Washington. The Senate's in session, as you know, but she asked me, which was an honor. Some of you may not just be surprised to see me here. Uh, 20 years ago, I did this, and I'm back for an encore uh, as of January 2nd, working for Senator Feinstein. I will quickly read this letter. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to welcome all the distinguished guests gathered tonight to recognize Louise Rennie's lifetime of outstanding professional achievements in the law. As many of you know, shortly after I became mayor, I appointed Louise to her seat on the Board of Supervisors and eight years later as city attorney. She served with distinction, distinction as city attorney for over 15 years and after retirement established a law firm that has provided legal guidance to local governments throughout the Bay Area. In recent years, I've had the pleasure of working closely with Louise as chair of our judicial application panel for Northern California. As an aside, we don't get to meet too often lately, but it's another issue. Um, as a United States Senator from the state of California, a longtime friend and colleague, I commend Louise for her many years of public service in both the Ninth Judicial Circuit Historical Society and the Northern District Court Historical Society for recognizing the legal achievements happening in our great state. I send my best wishes for a wonderful event. Sincerely, Diane Feinstein with a PS, Right on, Louise, it says on the bottom. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> Mrs. Edlin, honored guests, uh, friends and family of Louise Rennie, it is such an honor for me to introduce Louise Rennie is the first recipient of the Bill Edlin Award. Um, I knew of Bill, I didn't know Bill, but I've read about him. Um, and I did have the great privilege of being Louise's number two for most of her 16 years as the elected city attorney of San Francisco. Um, I want to tell you some of the other highlights of her career and of her leadership. But first I have Two quizzes for you. Name this groundbreaker of the legal profession. She went to Harvard Law School but graduated from Columbia. She was smart enough to get in when the quota was one woman to every 40 or 50 men. One to 40 or 50. Her husband was in a class ahead of her and became her lifelong champion. When she got out of law school, law firms were not hiring women. And I don't want to give this away, but she became notorious <laughs> for her legal work fighting sex discrimination. Um, I don't want any of the A students to blurt out the answer, so I'm going to help you. If you, if you answered Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and Louise Rennie, you got it right. Um, and um, um, like Marty and Louise, uh, I'm sorry, Marty and Ruth, uh, Paul and Louise, each stars of the profession. In fact, Paul, sitting right here, um, and Louise own this distinction. Both spouses have argued in the Supreme Court of the United States, um, and they're probably aren't too many others uh, like that. Uh, second quiz. This person was a leader of the Bay Area Bar and a leader of the community. Um, 
gave top priority to mentorship and became a fierce advocate for prevention of gun violence in the wake of the shooting of 14 people at 101 California, I think in 1993. And this person was the head of the advisory committee on judicial nominations. And if you answered either William Edland or Louise Rennie, you are right. Um, in terms of uh, that, that uh, terrible tragedy at 101 California, Bill started a whole organization now called the Gifford Law Center for the Prevention of Gun Violence. And up the street in City Hall, Louise sued the manufacturers of the gun. Um, in terms of community leadership and mentorship, both prided themselves on mentoring inside and outside the community. And I'll just say that Louise started and now leads uh, an organization called Alliance for Children, which provides mentors to at-risk kids in low-income parts of our city. Um, and Bill was the head of the Advisory Committee on Judicial nominations for the state bench. Louise for the federal bench. Striking parallelism, the committee that named Louise Rennie the first recipient of the Bill Edlund Award knew exactly what it was doing. I want to tell you, uh, share a few highlights of Louise's career after Harvard and Columbia. Law firms weren't hiring, straight to the public sector. First the FCC and then um, quickly to the state attorney general's office. She tells this story on herself. The hiring part, the hiring lawyer asked the question we don't ask today. Oh, you have two children. Why aren't you staying home with your kids? And Louise bit her tongue and didn't say what was on her mind. Because I'm driving them crazy. <laughs> and uh, Louise's daughter, Anne, and her brother, John, can probably testify that um, the brand of energy that Louise Rennie brings was made for the workplace. As a uh, deputy attorney general, Louise filed a lawsuit that stopped clear cutting around the redwood forests and trees in Humboldt County and Del Norte County. She argued many times in this building, I mentioned the Supreme Court. In the early 1970s, she was a founder and early president of the California Women Lawyers. Jim has, and, and Bill have both mentioned that in the wake of the tragedy in 1978, um, newly uh, made mayor, Diane Feinstein, turned to her friend, Louise Rennie, to fill Diane's seat on the board, and then um, three successful elections followed. In 1986, as Jim said, Diane Feinstein again turned to uh, Louise Rennie. I would, I would give Jim credit for that, but I think Diane is somebody who's known for making her own decisions, pretty much, huh? Um, uh, um, so, um, and again, three more elections until Louise stepped down in 2002, and Dennis Herrera became the city attorney. Um, but Louise didn't step down to rest on her laurels. The San Francisco Board of Education called, and Louise became its general counsel and a crime fighter. Louise recovered millions and millions of dollars for the children of San Francisco from corrupt vendors of computers selling to the schools. And when most of her peers were turning their full attention to her golf, uh, to their golf games. Louise turned her attention to entrepreneurship, started a law firm with John Holtzman, John, John, with John Holtzman, and today the Rennie Public Law Group is the leading law firm representing public entities up and down the state. So think about it environmentalist, Supreme Court oralist, founder of 
an organization promoting careers of women in the profession. Elected supervisor, elected city attorney, six elections. Crime fighter, founder of an organization supporting at-risk children. Entrepreneur, practitioner. I don't know about you, but I feel like going out and making something of my life. I mean, I... <laughs> I want to talk for a moment, if you'll indulge me, about leadership. What's at the core of leadership? Whether you're, uh, whether you're Martin Luther King or uh, Indira Gandhi, whether you're in business and you're Steve Jobs or you're Coco Chanel, great leaders come with a big vision. A big vision is a force field. It inspires it motivates. It aligns followers in pursuit of a common purpose. And Louise Rennie, when Diane Feinstein appointed her in 1986, came with a transforming vision. And that is that a local public law office did not need to rest on defending its client. It could bring affirmative litigation and advance the values of fairness, equal opportunity, public safety, public health, and did I mention saving the giants? I'll come, I'll come back to that, I'll come back to that. The first step for any leader is to make sure you have and are able to keep the right people on the bus. Dennis Herrera knows about that. Louise did two things. First, she turned to the great law firms of San Francisco. Morrison, Cooley, Brobeck, Ferella, to name a few. First associates flocked in, then partners. And let me tell you, there's equity in public service and working for a city, but not the kind of equity those partners left on the table to be part of Louise Rennie's vision. And the second thing Louise did to make sure that the doors of the bus were wide open and that it was accommodating so people stayed. This is 1986. She started the first daycare center in City Hall. Eat your heart out, Elizabeth Warren. <laughs> 1986. And the talent did come. To the point where Louise used to joke, I couldn't get hired in my own office. <laughs> and to the point where alums began moving to the state and the federal bench, I count 10, but I could be off. And why did that talent come? Because they were drawn by the vision, and Louise's actions spoke louder than, its word, uh, than, than her words. Bill mentioned, right out of the box, she sues the San Francisco Olympic Club for sex and race discrimination, becoming, as I said, notorious. Oh my God, Paul had been a member. <laughs> Paul, how many friends did you lose? <laughs> but legacy, today that club is an equal opportunity, not just golf course, not just athletic facility, but an equal opportunity forum for business networking and business development. That's the vision that Louise foresaw. Then, oh, I'm not sure, maybe it was 92, 93, uh, Louise took a risk about losing another friend, the owner of the Giants, Bob Lurie. Bob had the team halfway to Tampa Bay when L Louise assigned two lawyers, Jack Baer, who I think she brought in from Ferella, and Pat Mahoney, who'd been a partner at Cooley. And they got a preliminary injunction, buying time for new ownership to form and buy the team. Legacy, that beautiful ballpark on the waterfront, 
and three championships in the last nine years. Maybe didn't know all of their roles in that. Sometime around the same time, mid-1990s, Attorney General Dan Lundgren declined to follow the lead of the Mississippi Attorney General and eight other attorneys general in suing Big Tobacco. Louise jumped into the breach, XREL, state of California. San Francisco became the 10th state <laughs> and only city <laughs> to sue the tobacco companies. Legacy, $500 million for San Francisco, most of which Louise made sure went to rebuild the decrepit then, Laguna Honda Hospital, San Francisco's home for the indigent aged. Visit it now, it's a state-of-the-art facility. Legacy, equal opportunity, public health, old and young, rich and poor. Uh, I mentioned the gun case already, and all I want to say is that in 2019, suing gun manufacturers may seem ho-hum, but not in 1993 or 1994. I'm sure San Francisco was the first city to sue a gun manufacturer, probably the first public entity. And that vision was the vision of public safety that Bill Edlund and Louise Rennie shared. One more case, and then I'm done. Louise inherited a sex and race discrimination case against the San Francisco Police and Fire Departments. How many of you are defense lawyers? So you know the challenge of balancing your primary responsibility to protect your client's interest and nudge it toward a more enlightened future. The resolution of that case by Louise is evident in two facts today. The longest serving fire chief in San Francisco's history is Joanne Hayes White. And the fire chief today is Bill Scott, an African American. It is my extraordinary privilege to introduce to you the inaugural recipient of the William Edland Award. My former boss, my friend, my teacher, Louise Rennie. Thank you very much, Dennis, and members of the judiciary that are here. Thank you for coming today. Thank you for the members of the historical societies for granting me this award and in the company of Dennis Herrera and so many former deputies, people from the law firms that are here. It is really a particular honor to be the recipient of the Bill Edlund Award. Because my husband and I did know Bill, Mrs. Edlund. He was very, very special. And I know that his contributions throughout the legal community are obviously well remembered. The other day I happened to have lunch, I guess it was a couple weeks ago, that Robin, who's worked very hard on this event, and John Briscoe and I had lunch and we were thinking through about all of the things that Bill Edlund accomplished. So to be named as the first recipient of such an outstanding award, and particularly one that's so meaningful because it comes from members of the judiciary and my peers, 
really is, is very special. So I thank you all for granting me this award, and I thank you for this very special occasion. Uh, I, you know, I stand here today, though, because I have been a very lucky person. I've been lucky for two reasons. First of all, I have a wonderful family. My brother just flew in from Oregon, and as my brother and I can remember, we had parents who, there was no discrimination between boys and girls in the family. We were all to do well in school, we were all to do whatever we wanted, and when I said I was going to law school, when my teachers were telling me, oh, girls don't go to law school, my mother, who never was able to go to college because their family was too poor, she said, well, of course you're going to go to law school, Louise. So my brother is also a lawyer, and some of you may know him. If you want to have uh, a buddy who is funny and smart and a heart of gold, you'd be thinking of my brother. Now, I'll tell you another story. When I was growing up, I absolutely was not getting married. Absolutely not getting married. I was going to have a career, and that was going to be it. Well, I think this guy named Paul Rennie, who happened to be the boy next door, somehow or other, I have to tell you, within two weeks, we were already talking about getting married. And when we went home at Christmas time, I think it was some surprise to our families, but I don't think much. But my mother has always said, and you can understand why, that if Paul and I were to ever get a divorce, she was on his side. <laughs> because, I mean, if you really wanted to tell stories, and I know we don't want to go on and on, but, you know, the Olympic Club battle was no small feat, and poor Paul is the one who, in fact, did lose friends, and, and, but he, you know, stood by thick and thin. And then when our girls were little, and they had the mother's afternoon tea in those days, and I couldn't go, Paul would go. And so I got home early this one day, and Ann and Chris came, and Mommy, Mommy, why was Daddy at school today? Everybody's talking about it. So Paul ended up being the first male homeroom teacher in the first grade. <laughs> so I'm here to tell you, too, that this is unbelievable, but that despite the obstacles I put in Paul's way along the way, we will be celebrating our 60th wedding anniversary this summer. So that's <laughs> impossible. Our daughter, Anne, who is here, representing the younger generations of the family, is an art teacher and head of the art department in Sun Valley, Idaho. And she is here representing our daughter, Chris, who's a lawyer in Houston, and our three grandsons also in Houston. And I am so happy she's here. It really just adds one more special note to have your family here. And of course, Monique Fries, who has been introduced, has been such a close family over the years, we call her our adopted daughter. Now, I think she's agreed to that designation, but I'm not sure. And of course, we have a good family friend in Michelle Lyons and so many of you here. But the second reason I have been so lucky is because I have had the privilege of working with absolutely outstanding people. Strategic thinkers in the law, looking how to do the best for the community, and nice people to boot with integrity. Dennis was the num number two person, but as I have always said, I only listened to what they told me to do. It's been said that we made a, a trail, if you will, by affirmative litigation that we did. 
but I cannot let this moment pass without specially acknowledging John Holtzman, because he was the one who really came up and pushed the idea that the city attorney had to do more than just defend the city, but take the opportunity to do good, if you will, and, and work for the taxpayers and the consumers. So John, I do want to especially acknowledge and thank you for your leadership in the office. And of course, if I was going to go through and name everybody, I would be here all day. And I'm sure then there would be, Your Honor, a petition for reconsideration of my <laughs> receiving this award. So let me end by saying thank you for this award. Uh, I shall never forget this day. It's been meaningful to have you all here. It's been so wonderful to see so many of you that I remember working with over the years. And Dennis, you're lucky, and Jesse, to have such a good crowd still, because the city attorney's office of San Francisco is outstanding. So thank you all very, very much. Thank you. formality of presenting the the award Thank and we you. and we have two well and since two. this award will actually uh, live in the lawyers lounge at 450 golden gate oh to acknowledge okay. your incredible accomplishment and bill we have an actual gift that you can take oh. with you thank you <laughs> i like the box <laughs> let me uh, just read this there this will hang uh, in perpetuity in the lawyer's lounge at 450 Golden Gate on the 18th floor in a very prominent place. And it has a picture of Bill, and then it says the Bill Edlin Award for Professionalism in the Law, presented to those individuals who exemplify each of the following criteria. Excellence as a lawyer, civility, commitment to the legal profession, and leadership in the community. And the very first honoree is Louise Rennie, Esquire, 2019. All right, so uh, Robin, you, ha you do the honors. And uh, just to conclude, because no event can end without the appropriate thank yous, before everyone goes, I just want to take a moment longer here to thank the folks who made today possible, and then we can all go eat and drink. Um, I'd like to thank the Edland Award Committee for their time and commitment to this event. Our speakers today, Judge Alsup, Rigesh Tangri, Jeff Fisher, Michael Abraham, Jim Lazarus, Dennis Aftergut, and of course, Louise. I'd also like to thank the Ninth Circuit staff who took time out of an incredibly busy week to make this all happen, with special thanks to Vanessa Castillo, Bradley Van de Hay, Kwame Copeland, and Richard August. On behalf of the boards of the Ninth Circuit and the Northern District Court Historical Society, we'd like to encourage you to join our societies, or even just to make a one-time donation, because without your support, events like this can't happen. We'll send you an email with all the details about how to do that, so when you get the email, please do take a moment to open it. Um, and with that, I'd like to invite you all out to the hallway around the corner for refreshments. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you.